Well, thank you all for being here today. I'm excited to share with you my work on gradient-based wind farm layout optimization. My name is Jerry Thomas, and as we all, we all know here, this is my dissertation defense. So I've been doing this work in the Flow Lab. In the Flow Lab, we do flight, optimization, and wind. The physics involved for flight and wind energy are very similar. And then we work to make these things better and find better ways to design to um, make things work more efficiently and effectively. Come on, guys. Um, so why wind energy? A wind farm is a highly complex system and designing a wind farm is a difficult and a large task. When the you know, wind comes on the, on the wind farm, the air behind a wind turbine is slowed down and made more turbulent, which reduces the amount of energy that is available in the wind for the downstream turbines to convert into electricity. So here we see a um, wind farm under unique conditions where as the air passes over, it's right at the dew point and we have condensation occur on the other side of the turbines. And so we can kind of visualize this slower, more turbulent air a little bit. Um, we call a wake. So overall, the energy that is lost due to wakes is 10 to 20% in a wind farm. In a single direction where it's row aligned like this, you can see there's wind turbines in these wakes, the loss can be 70 to 80% of the available energy, just lost to wakes. Now this would be a simple problem if all we had was wind from a single direction. We could just move the turbines to the side and we'd be done but wind comes from any given direction and with varying probability and with varying wind speed. So here we have a wind rose and a wind speed distribution that follows a Weibull distribution. So in this plot, we have 360 wind directions accounted for. We've been these and each of them has a varying probability. And this becomes a much more complicated problem. We need to balance the energy produced in each direction. So let's imagine we have a simple wind farm with 38 wind turbines. We're going to take this center turbine, each of these circles is a wind turbine, and the red is the boundary, we can't go outside of that. We're going to move this center turbine. Now, as we move it, we plot the energy production, the annual energy production, or AEP, of the wind farm. And we've graphed that here as the darker and lower is the lower AEP, the yellow and the higher is the higher AEP. And our job is to pick out the highest peak. That's very difficult to do for this relatively simple space. We only have two design variables. We have the X and Y of our blue turbine. But we actually have, in real life, in what we really care about, we have 38 turbines or 76 design variables. We can no longer visualize that. And this, the multimodality of this problem, these many different peaks, makes it difficult to, to solve. The solution is typically done using what's called gradient-free optimization methods. They, do, they use strictly information coming out from our mathematical models that is just the, the function value, or in this case, the AEP. And they do this using often heuristics where they step through the space, but not necessarily following the shape of the space. And they do quite well often on these problems with lots of rises and falls, lots of local optima. However, these gradient free methods scale exponentially as we increase the number of design variables. So it requires more function calls, which means more cost in computation time. And also once we get over about 30 design variables, most of the gradient free methods can no longer solve these problems. A few can, and we'll discuss that later, but they still require many, many, many function calls. So we have worked to solve this problem using gradient based methods, where instead of just using the function value, we are using the slope of the space, which gives us more information about what's going on in the design space. But there are some fundamental challenges, which is why these methods have not typically been applied. So we worked to, to create these solutions. 
First is there's discontinuities in the design space. There's jumps where the value changes rapidly and gradient-based methods struggle with that. There's places where the derivative changes rapidly, which can also cause problems. So this is, you're going up and we treat a flat spot and the derivative changed very quickly there. These flat spots in general also cause a problem because they lead to premature convergence of the optimization. When a gradient-based optimizer hits a flat spot or a zero gradient, it says often I'm done, we got the solution. But we may not actually be at a solution if that's not something that should have been in the model to represent physical space. Next, we computed exact and sufficient derivatives. So one of the problems with gradient-based optimization is that we have to calculate the slope. When we have a lot of design variables, we have to perturb each design variable differing number of times, depending on how we're doing it, to calculate the slope. <clears throat> But using algorithmic differentiation, we're able to reduce the number of function calls by three orders of magnitude for reasonably large farms. Now, the problem with local optima um, is, the is the biggest reason that is cited in literature for not using these methods. Um, we developed a new method called wake expansion continuation, or WEC, that allows us to at least partially overcome this problem with local optima. Another concern is that has been expressed about optimization with the simple models that we use is that they might be exploiting inaccuracies in the model. So if we imagine this light blue line is our real space, and maybe our model is this dashed dark blue line. If we optimize to this high point, we have actually created a very poor solution. Now, thankfully, we don't have this going on in our models, as we will discuss later, but we checked through this and verified that we do not have this problem. Comparisons to other algorithms is important. There's a lot of methods that are out there that are established in industry practice and in research practice. And we needed to show that our new method was not just more efficient, but could also find comparable results. And so we did this through a international collaborative effort that I was able to lead through um, with working with seven different organizations in five different countries. It was a really neat experience to work with all these people. And we're able to pull experts from industry and from academia with their algorithms of choice on the same problem to compare. <clears throat> so those are our contributions to this work. And these contributions are published in these four journal articles. Um, Improving the Flores Wind Plant Model for Compatibility with Gradient-Based Optimization, published in Wind Energy or Wind Engineering. Um, wake Expansion, Continuation, Multimodality Reduction in the Wind Farm Layout Optimization Problem, published in Wind Energy. And then gradient-based wind farm layout optimization results compared with large eddy simulations. This is in review right now with wind energy science. And finally, a comparison of eight optimization methods applied to a wind farm layout optimization problem, which is in preparation for submission to wind energy science. Along the way, I've had the opportunity to collaborate with a lot of other people on many papers. So besides those four that are in my dissertation, I've been able to co-author two other journal articles and eight conference papers and in part because this is the work that i've been doing is very fundamental to using gradient based methods i've been able to get involved in the, the beginnings of a lot of projects getting things off and rolling we also have published our code that we've used our wind farm simulation and optimization techniques in flowfarm.jl which is a julia package that is open source so anyone can download and use our code for their own work the rest of this presentation will proceed as follows. I'll give a very brief introduction to wind farm modeling, followed by a discussion of each one of these um, problems and our solutions, the model smoothing derivatives, gradient-based solutions of local optima, comparisons to large eddy simulations, which is how we checked for the inaccuracies potentially, and then comparisons to other optimization methods. And finally, we'll wrap up with a conclusion. So, Wind energy, the main things I want you to take away from this slide is the rotor swept area is the full area that the blades may contact. And the hub is at the center of the rotor swept area. We model the wind speed downstream of a wind turbine using a wake model. And so this is showing using one of our simple wake models. 
where we have just visualized the wakes or the slow areas behind the wind turbine. And you can see the varying wind speed vertically as well as horizontally. And then the turbulence in this model is captured. And so we can see that the wake takes a longer time to get back up to speed in this front turbine, but there's then increased turbulence. So while this second turbine sees lower wind speed, the wake recovers more quickly due to the increased turbulence. Mixes in the free stream wind around it more rapidly. So once we have the wakes modeled, we can predict the wind speed in a given location for a single wake, but we need to be able to combine the wakes and figure out what's going on in the air if we combine them. So you do that using what's called a wake combination model. Um, one of these, it's the most common, resembles the L2 norm, and others resemble a linear combination. There's just different approaches to combining these. Once we have the wakes combined and have a, a candle dose physics well, then we can um, calculate the effective wind speed at the rotor swept area. So for our simple wind models that we use for the wind turbines, we need a single inflow wind speed for the wind turbine. So we can, Looking at this, this is depicting our different methods. The gray circle is a cross section of the wake. And then this is the wind turbine that is in the wake. So we can take a single sample at the hub location and use that as an estimate for the wind speed across the rotor swept area. And that's been shown to be a reasonable approximation, but it still has some error. Or we can take many samples across that rotor swept area and average them to get the wind speed across the rotor. And that's gives us a much better approximation. Alternatively, we could do a full integration of that space, but that is computationally costly and we cannot afford that in the optimization setting. However, some wake models have a constant wind speed across the cross section of the wake that only changes downstream. In those cases, we can use this um, overlap area to do a weighted average and calculate the effective speed on that rotor using that directly without having to do the interval. Once we have the wind speed at the rotor, we can plug it into our power equation, figure out the power of each wind turbine, which is based on the cube of the velocity, which is why the wind the wakes are such a big deal. And so as, that as, as the velocity goes down, we have a huge decrease in power. We, we often model this using a power coefficient, which is a function of the wind speed itself also. Um, may follow a curve like this. As we increase the wind speed, it gets to a point where our wind turbine cannot produce more power, even though there's more power available in the wind. And so the CP drops off here, but we maintain a steady power production at that point. Finally, we combine all of these powers for each wind turbine, for each wind speed, for each wind direction, or do it in more efficient ways, depending on the model that we're using, to calculate the annual energy production. And then we can use the annual energy production to predict the losses in the weight, which is one minus the AEP divided by the AD, ideal AEP. And the ideal AEP is just the energy that would be produced during the year if all wind turbines were to see the free stream air the full year. So our first problem, discontinuities. We'll talk about a few of the models that we used. So the first model, that's, this was uh, developed in 1983. This is by Jensen. He presented two potential models, both of them using this linear spread, but then across the wake, one used a top hat profile and one used a cosine profile. Now this is pretty smooth. Um, the top hat obviously is not going to work for us for gradient based optimization because we have this huge flat area. We don't know how to get out of the wake. The cosine model is reasonable. <laughs> One of the problems though, is that we cut off prematurely. And so because it comes to zero, we have no idea of where there's close wakes, whereas the wakes kind of slowly peter out. And it's more effective to have a model that will give us those small, but still important further out interactions. There is one discontinuity here, however, which is right across the rotor hub. As we go from upstream to downstream to this turbine, there is a step change. And this was an obvious place to start. So we have wind speed, drops as we go across the rotor. Now, we investigated this and found that we can place turbines in our optimization up to nearly machine precision on top of each other. And it doesn't cause a problem unless they are placed exactly on top of each other. And so we didn't do anything about this one because it didn't, didn't play an important role. 
The next wake model that we're looking at is the multi-zone, which was previously known as the Flores model. That's the name of the paper previously. And it is essentially three Jensen models that we just looked at stacked on top of each other with varying spreads. All right, so we have an inner zone that goes down, an outer zone that stays pretty straight, but it still is expanding. And then the most outer zone that expands rapidly and has the lowest wind speed. And then using a circular overlap, we can get a fairly smooth transition across the wave. This model also accounts for yaw. So as a wind turbine is facing the wind, when it turns, it places a thrust, which is perpendicular, has a perpendicular component to the wind, and it can move the weight to the side. So you can see it's turning in, pushes the weight to the side. That can be advantageous for moving the weight away from downstream turbines. There's a, a few discontinuities here. This one is, you know, may not have caused many problems, but it was easy to fix, and we wanted to make sure that it was smooth. So this is where the inner wake is coming down and, and decreasing in its size. We put a simple fermite cubic spline just to smooth that region out. The more important problem here is this flat spot where we have a non-physical region with a zero value gradient. And in this case, it can cause premature convergence with a turbine right in the center of a wake, the worst spot we could put it in the wind, the wind farm. We don't want that. So we added um, a factor to this model to add a little bit of curvature without significantly changing the output values. <coughs> so you can see in this inset, we have a little curvature there, but when you zoom out, it looks almost flat. That's enough for the gradient-based optimization to get out of that core region in the middle. So this is taking a wind turbine downstream of another, just went this direction, we move it across. And then the wind speed drops and flats in the middle. So we solved this. This is the um, main equation for the multi-zone model, where the C sub I value here is a function of the X and Y values of the turbines. And it's a piecewise function where the actual values of the Cs are this equation here, the, which resembles very much the Jensen model. Um, we have the diameter of the turbine divided by some other inputs. We added this F cosine, right? So this cosine term is 0 0.5 times 1 plus the cosine of pi times r over the r max, which eventually, it essentially just allows us to look at the, um, sorry, r max being the width of this, this weight um, at the full overlap. So we have the diameter of the weight and the diameter of the rotor. So as soon as they're going to intersect, or stop intersecting, that's where we stop having the cosine term. So it follows that same spread of the wake at all different points. And we tested this on a very simple case, just three wind turbines. So we have wind just that direction, three wind turbines in a row. And you can see why we have the flat. This black circle is the rotor swept area of a downstream turbine taken at this cross section right here. And so if we move it slightly side to side, there's no change. The derivatives are zero. If we optimize using the original model here, we get turbines in a line, or a very poor solution. At least it spread them out. We get some weight recovery, a little bit more energy, but it's definitely not what we're going for. With the added curvature, we're able to get them to move to the sides of the wake and avoid that premature convergence. The last wake model that we used is the Vistanka model. And it has, just like the other models, this distance continuity across the rotor that we're not worrying about, but it has this large region that's undefined where there's no model here. And this is because in our simple models, it's really hard to capture what's actually going on there. So a lot of the models just say, we're not even going to try. We're going to wait till things have stabilized in the far wake and then model it from there. But we need something there for our optimization to work with if we put turbines in that location. So we used a linear interpolation here to just fill in a simple model here. We're not going to be placing turbines there. The actual accuracy of the predictions are less important. It's more about following the overall shape of the space than that would be there. So um, the other difficulty here is that this point where it's defined or not defined is not fixed geographically to the turbine. It moves depending on the wind speed, it moves depending on the rotor diameter and other inputs. And so we did some work to figure out exactly where that's going to be at all times and do our interpolation there. So then we get the full wake model that we discussed previously. Okay, so we're on to our next problem, calculating the derivatives. Now that we have <coughs> continuous smooth models, we need to calculate derivatives. And we were able to get a 
three order of magnitude reduction in the function calls. The derivative basically is showing how fast our function value is changing. How fast does our AEP change with the movement of each turbine in each direction? So we can do cal we can calculate the derivatives in one of a few different ways. Um, one is to do analytics. That's the way that you learn in the basic calculus class. And I actually ended up doing this in um, a math cat like program, and it was 17, 18 pages of equations that you do not want to implement in code and you do not want to maintain as the research changes. Um, so that's off the table. Finite differences, we basically perturb each turbine, check in each different direction, and we can calculate the slope. That's very expensive. It takes a lot of computational power. And the reason we're looking at these gradient-based methods in the first place is to get the efficiencies. And at least that's one of the big reasons, to get the efficiencies that are available using these methods. So our last option is, or our next option, there are some others I don't mention here. These are the main ones. Algorithmic differentiation. And so I should say this is the, I should have mentioned this, this is the Jacobian, which is a matrix that holds the partial derivatives of the function values. So the outputs here being the power of each turbine with respect to the position of each turbine, both the X and Y. So in our 38 turbine case, we would have 76 columns and we would have at least 38 rows depending on our situation. So it gets quite large very quickly. So there's two methods of algorithmic differentiation, source code transformation um, and operator overloading. And we used, or at least the two that we used in our work here. Source code transformation, you provide your code that you've made sure is differentiable and smooth and meets all the requirements to uh, algorithm that then steps through line by line, calculates the derivatives of each elementary function, writes a new code that provides the derivatives at the end. And you can call that each time you make the derivative. Source or operator overloading, we change the input types of our functions and our um, functions themselves. So that they provide not just the function value, but also the derivatives for each elementary function. And so we're able to efficiently calculate the results there as well. We tested our, our uh, derivatives on this form. Now, I have to mention that these methods have existed, right, the algorithmic differentiation, but they had not been applied to the wind farm problem. Um, and so this was the first application that we know of to of using algorithmic differentiation in the wind farm layout optimization problem. So using this grid shaped wind farm, but scaling it starting with four turbines, so it'd be just this lower square, all the way up to 81 turbines. So it'd be nine by nine large grid wind farm. Um, Design variables start at 284 because we are moving not just the X and Y locations, but also the yaw of each turbine in each direction. So we have a lot of design variables here. And then our constraints are spacing between turbines and staying inside the boundary. And here's how we scale using the finite difference versus the algorithmic differentiation. So using the AD, which is algorithmic differentiation, we scale much more slowly than the finite differences, which means we'll be able to be more efficient for larger problems. Now, going back to our simple three turbine farm, if we now apply not just our smooth version of the models, but also the exact derivatives, because when we use AD, we get precise derivatives to machine precision. And so they're, they're more accurate than the finite difference, which is what we used in the previous example. Um, so we got this using finite differences that I showed before. Now using algorithmic differentiation, we get a much better result where there's there's less interaction. They've moved into almost a line. We'd, we'd hope to get just a straight line across there, and we're very close to that. I'm testing this again on a larger farm. This is 25 wind turbines, 72 wind directions. So this is varying probability and varying wind speed in each direction. And comparing, we get this is using finite difference, all three of these using finite difference. And then these two methods using AD, you can see we got a three order of magnitude reduction in the cost for just this problem. Now comparing the our smooth version, which is this cosine with the exact gradient, and the cosine with the finite difference, the red and the magenta, just having the smoothness in there also improves the or reduces the computational cost <laughs> besides getting better results. 
So now the problem of local optima. We've got smooth models and we have derivatives, but we still have a multimodal problem. Lots of peaks. How do we find the one we want? So we developed a, a new method that I mentioned before called wake expansion continuation. To introduce this, we have a Gaussian distribution. If you've taken statistics or just a lot of other things in life, you run into this distribution. But we're going to change this a little bit and say we're no longer going to let the coefficient be dependent on the standard deviation. We're going to make those separate. So now, if we independently change the spread of this, we can create a surrogate model for a design space that may look like this. So say we have a whole bunch of different um, valleys. So here we're trying to get the lowest one. And so the lowest peak is here. And we're doing a summation of a bunch of essentially Gaussian shaped <coughs> curves that have different magnitudes of their peak and different spreads. And they combine to form this space. If we start over here, we'd get stuck here. And same thing from the other side. So this is extremely um, starting point dependent if we try to solve this with a gradient based <coughs> method. But if we increase the spread, the standard deviation of each of those functions, they combine. They're still being summed. And we create this much more well behaved curve. And so we can optimize this one starting here. We go right down the middle, reduce the standard deviation, and then use this as our starting point in this optimization. And we get shifted over a little bit to the min of that. Reduce it again. We shift again just slightly to get the minimum of that. Finally, going back to our original design space, we found the global optima using a purely gradient based method. So, going back to our wake models for wind turbines, this is the Vistanka model, the basic equation. Several of these elements here are functions themselves, but it has the basic components of a Gaussian distribution. It has this magnitude term, it has a horizontal spread, it also has a vertical spread. So, it's a um, radial Gaussian distribution, essentially. So as it goes down to the term of the wake, we have essentially a circular wake, but it could be an ellipse if we change the spread here. So we added this red term here, this C, or what we call the WEC value, to spread out the wake independent of the magnitude term. So we can just combine the wakes, and we get a similar effect. So as we move a wind turbine across the wakes of two other turbines, we just have wind going down here, we get this gray line. And if we were to start our optimization for this farm in a poor spot, we would optimize to be right in between the two wind turbines, which would be a very poor location. And then if we spread out those wakes, just like we did in our simple Gaussian example, they start to combine and we can get this nice smooth space that will push our wind turbine to either side without getting stuck. Again, using a purely gradient based approach. We tested this using four different case studies. One that used 16 wind turbines in 20 directions the top, the next one using 38 wind turbines and 12 wind directions, the next one using 38 wind turbines again and um, 36 wind directions, and this time using a, a different wind speed in each direction. These two used a single wind speed across all directions. And then finally, with 60 wind turbines, this is a, an actual wind farm called the Princess Amalia Wind Park, and optimizing with 70 wind directions, again with using a, the average wind speed in each direction. And we found that across all these case studies using the Vistanka model and the Jensen model, so these four are showing the Vistanka model, this is showing the Jensen model, um, we, our new method was able to outperform a gradient based method by itself, as well as a gradient free method called ALPSO, or the Augmented Lagrangian Particles Form Optimization. And we were able to, on average, find the best value for the wind farm across 200 different starts that we gave to every optimization algorithm. Now, if we look at this case specifically and plot that as on a histogram, we can see that the worst case using our new method, SNOPT plus WEC, was better than the best case using SNOPT without WEC. So we're able to shift this entire distribution over to a much lower weight loss, as well as tighten up that distribution, making the results more self-consistent. So there is still some variance, but not nearly what was there, and the results were much better. So we can expect to be able to get better results even running much fewer times. Looking at the convergence of each of these, um, this is on a log scale. So this distance is actually quite large. 
to be going way out there in a linear scale. Um, we can see the effect of WEC allowing the optimizer to travel through local optima. So here the, we have the dark blue line is with WEC, and it stays at a higher value longer and then drops into that better location as we have refined the space and gone through the local optima. And so it did take a few more function calls than SNOP alone, but found much better results as we showed, showed before. Also <laughs> found better results than ALPSO, and then we tried ALPSO with WEC and found some improvements there, but not as much as we got using the gradient-based approach. And then looking at the case four, the 60 wind turbine with 72 directions, <laughs> In this case, not only did we get the best <coughs> results using WEC, but it also reduced the number of function calls. Now we're running six optimizations for the WEC series, where we start with the wide wake and re-optimize and re-optimize as we reduce those. So even with those extra optimizations, we still can reduce for that large farm the number of function calls needed while simultaneously getting a better result. So now we have models that meet the criteria for gradient-based optimization. We have the derivatives calculated efficiently. We have reduced the problem with local optima. And we now need to address this concern of, are we exploiting inaccuracies in our models? Now, we, it's not very reasonable to build a whole other wind farm and test it and tear down and test again and see if we're, we're getting bad results. Um, so we tested using large eddy simulations, which is applied to computational fluid dynamics. So this is not one of our actual spaces, but just to describe what's going on. In computational fluid dynamics, we divide the space into a bunch of little pieces called cells for, the, for some of the types, the type we used. And we solve the fluid properties across each cell. And we need to have smaller cells when we're close to places where the fluid properties are changing rapidly. Um, so in this case, this is wind going across an airfoil. But in our case, we have a wind farm where we have these 38 turbines. We designed this farm, this round farm, specifically for use with large eddy simulations. Um, this farm, using these 12 wind directions, it takes about 500 cores a day and a half to solve the values for a single wind direction. So that's a lot of computational resources and not very re reasonable for use during optimization. So we'd love to do that. They're much more accurate than our simple models that I've been talking about, but it's just not reasonable. So we designed this farm so we could use a single precursor, get leveraging as much space as possible in the LES um, domain. And you can just rotate the farm locations of the turbines to do each direction instead of simulating each direction separately, which reduced the computational cost substantially, but still was a day and a half on 500 cores for each direction. So comparing our results from our simple models for the optimization versus those for the LES, our, the simple Vistanka model showed 7.7% improvement in the annual energy production, where SOPA, which was the tool we used for the large eddy simulations that were run for us by NREL for us to compare to, um, took 9.3%. So not only are these results good, but they're actually better than we were predicting. This was a good finding. Um, now we look at individual directions here. So now we're plotting the power of the farm in each direction. So here's our 12 different directions. And SOFA in blue versus the Pastanka model in gray, you can see that we get similar shape, but we have quite the offset. Same thing for our optimized case, the dark blue and the orange. Similar shape, it's kind of flattened the curve, bringing up the power production in each direction, but we still have an offset. So this is Good news in some respect that we're getting the right trends, we're following the right shapes. The actual values may not be quite where we want them. But that's okay for the optimization. Um, if we look at terms of annual energy loss, so now instead of saying what are our actual you know, gigawatt hour predictions for AP, now let's look at how much energy was lost or what our annual energy loss is in each direction for these two models. And here you can see that they predict much more closely. So if we have a good handle on our power predictions for the farm, we can still predict the losses quite well from our simple models. And so here also we're weighting the wind speeds. So this direction is much more prominent, has a higher probability. So it has a much higher loss over the year. And in the optimization, we're able to bring that down substantially. So that had the most improvement 
the optimizer was able to work with that and bring it down. And then if we look at the annual energy improvement in each direction, um, this is going from the base to the optimized. We have very similar shape and a pretty, pretty close match to our curve here. So we're, we're pretty confident in this point that we are not exploiting weird inaccuracies. There's obviously an offset, but we can work with that in the optimization because what we care about is finding the good solution. And are we putting them in good solutions or not? We also looked at the individual turbine powers, and I don't expect you to digest all of this rapidly. The main upshot is that individual turbines have less than 30% error. For our simple models that we're dealing with across the wind farm, that was pretty reasonable. And a lot of them are much, much less than that in the one or 2% range. We did, however, notice that our optimized layout for this case had a nested hexagonal pattern. And when overlaying hexagons to match up with these rows that were created, we found that at 25 degrees and 55 degrees, we lined up, and those happen to fall precisely in between our wind directions. So each of these corners goes right in between wind directions. This means that the turbines along these walls, these, these borders, are aligned in directions that are not simulated. They're being ignored. So those losses aren't accounted for. It's great for our results as far as it looks, but it's not safe. We don't want to build this wind farm. Um, so we wanted to determine how many directions were actually needed. And some studies have shown that we only need a few, maybe 20 wind directions. Some studies have shown that we need hundreds of wind directions. And the problem with a lot of this has been that it's focused on calculating the energy production of the wind farm, not how many directions are needed during an optimization until our layouts are no longer affected by the discretization of our wind resource. And so we ran 100 optimizations for each one of these data points. And so this blue is the results as calculated using the number of wind directions along this axis. And then the error bars are the, showing the high and lows. So in this case, we show that for low numbers of wind, of wind directions, um, sorry, I'm gonna, the orange one is our control, right? So the orange at every point is taking these same layouts, recalculating the AUP based on 360 directions. And so essentially what we're saying, seeing here is that if we only use a few wind directions, we're making the farm worse. We get these predictions that we have these huge gains and it was actually negative once we account for all the wind directions. Once we get up to about 50 wind directions, then we can be confident that it's the optimization is no longer being um, influenced by our discretization. So if we use at least 50 wind directions, we can be pretty confident that we have optimized to a good light layout and will still be good when we use the full wind resource. And finally, now that we have smoothed our models, calculated the derivatives, reduce the problem of local optima and checks to make sure that we're not exploiting these weird values or weird things in the models. Um, now we need comparisons to other algorithms show that we're performing as well as these other methods that are already being used. Now we had done previous studies um, in some conference papers and looking at, you know, again, collaborating with people, but the problems that we used were smaller. And they were easy problems for gradient based optimization relatively. We went up to about 64 wind turbines, but <coughs> gradient based always won. Our new methods dominated everything except some results from a quantum computer that were submitted, where they can do a totally exhaustive search of the design space. And so we were pretty confident that our method was working really well, but we wanted to really test it. And there were some complaints saying, oh, these, these, these test cases aren't as valid because they're really relatively easy for gradient based methods. Let's give it something that's going to be hard for that. And we designed this case specifically to be difficult for gradient based methods. Um, this is difficult in that it has five separate zones. The wind turbines can move between the zones, but the final layout cannot have any turbines in these no-go zones. We need to have shipping links. This is based on a real wind farm, the Borschle three and four wind farms. And so gradient free methods, they can discretize the space. They can approach this in different ways so that they can move continuously between the zones and never put them in the middle. And there's several things they can do to handle that. Gradient free, we need a continuous design space. 
So what we did to handle this is we just created an exterior boundary and said, we're just going to ignore the shipping lanes at first, run a single optimization with our high WEC value. So the weights are spread. So we spread everything out as much as we can, optimize. And then once we've done that with that full outer boundary, then we put back in the shipping lanes. We assign each turbine to its closest region and then finish our WEC series of optimizations. Um, in this case, we used 360 wind directions and 20 wind speeds. We were, did not require to be to optimize with this. This was how each algorithm was tested, right? So the final layouts were all run using this full 360 directions and 20 speeds in every direction. Um, we used 100 directions, be on the safe side here, and the average wind speed <clears throat> for our runs. Now we compared eight algorithms. Like I said before, we got a bunch of um, experts in their fields, people from industry for um, GPS and CMAES and um, DPA. Those are all industry professionals. Do this for a living. Then you choosing the route algorithms that they want to use. Um, S not plus WEC was ours. And then Debo was developed by a research institution specifically for this case study by an algorithms expert. And then um, GAGB was done by another research institution. Um, this is the only other gradient based. He used his genetic algorithm to find the first locations and then used a gradient base to refine them. And then Andermach and PG were also from research institutions. So we have a good smattering of research and industry to compare against people that are very proficient in this area. And these are the results that we found using this case. And you can note right off that all of them place the turbines on the borders. All right, so we have very similar layouts. Tight spacing along the boundaries, loose spacing inside with kind of a grid. And so how do these stack up in terms of losses? Um, well, our first one had, our initial layout had 17.3% roughly um, weight loss. And then the rest, all of the optimized layouts were within 0.2% weight loss, which is basically tighter than we can confidently say there's a difference with our level of modeling. And so they're all very comparable results. Debo, the method that was developed specifically to solve this problem, to find the best layout according to the models. The next one was DPA, which is an industry professional that um, runs software that's used by a lot of wind engineering companies. And then they found the second one, and ours was exactly comparable to that. They were if you go out in significant figures, ours was just a slightly higher or slightly less weight loss. And then ours was the, the third out of these. So we were able to show that we did find comparable results to these other heavily used methods or some new methods. Some of these were new, some of them were very, very heavily used. <clears throat> and then in terms of function calls, this is the total function calls. So if they chose to use one run or to run a whole bunch of different optimizations or different starting points, whatever it chose, this is total function calls. Some used upwards of a million function calls. Um, some used 100,000. Um, and these two ran only once. They just started, finished, one run. We chose to run 10 because we knew we still do have some variation in our results. Um, but nine of those 10 fell within the range spanned by these. So we could have run a lot less. So the total was 85,000. A single run was less than 10,000 function calls. So we were able to find comparable results with less cost. And there's more that we plan to do. I'm hoping to actually, since this is still being prepared for publication, there's some efficiencies in the code that I'm hoping to, to use to reduce that further as we continue to work on this. Um, basically, basically done, we just want to try that one other thing and see what happens. But we have been able to show that we did more efficiency, comparable layouts. So we have adjusted the models for um, using gradient-based methods, um, they're defined everywhere, the smoothness requirements are met, and there's no false convergence to the flat spots. We found exact and efficient derivatives, reducing the function calls by three orders of magnitude for the gradient-based problem. Reduce the problem of local optima using our wake expansion continuation method, which allows us to travel past local optima and reduce the, the weight loss, as well as reducing the standard deviation of the distributions. We compared the results to large eddy simulations to make sure that we're not exploiting any inaccuracies in the models, um, demonstrated real improvements with the simple models, and found that we do need at least 51 directions during our optimization. 
and then compare it to other algorithms. We're able to demonstrate that Quack finds comparable results to gradient-free optimization methods and finds them more efficiently. Future work, we are hoping to have more efficiencies found in doing this problem. So first we have sparsity. So these are the elements of the Jacobian we showed earlier, each of the partial derivatives. The dark ones are the ones that actually matter. The light blue would be ones that are essentially zero. And rather than calculating every value, the ones that maybe don't matter as much, there's ways we can predict which those will be, cut them out, and Benjamin Barella sitting right there is working on that in our lab right now. I'm excited to see where that goes. Surrogate models are another option. Um, there you can, there, there's some new models that instead of accounting for each individual one direction, they cut out that entire summation term and predict just total influences across the board for each turbine. I'm really interested in trying this WEC method with those and seeing if we can um, solve this problem very, very efficiently using some of those um, surrogates or alternate alternate modeling approaches. And finally, starting locations are still important. And so you get to do some more research into how to choose the best starting locations. And finally, this, this image that I didn't um, announce in the beginning, this is our optimal wind farm that we found using WEC in the study that we presented WEC in. And this is showing the wakes going downstream for that single wind direction. So thank you all very much for being here and look forward to taking your questions.